I'm your host, Jay Poole, and this is Potster Podcast. Thanks so much for joining me. Before we begin, I would like to give a Patreon shout out to Zach, who donated at our highest level. Thank you very much for your support. If you want to hear your name on an upcoming episode of your favorite Flying Machine Network podcast, go to patreon.com slash flying machine, where you can donate as little as a dollar. You can get this and a number of other great perks. We truly appreciate your support. Your Patreon donation goes towards us being able to produce more quality content, and as we gain more Patreon supporters, we'll be able to do some other really fun things for you guys as well. But even if you aren't able to donate, there are other ways to help. You listening to our shows, subscribing, leaving reviews, and telling your friends help us immensely. Today's episode will be an interview I conducted with two esteemed guests. Benjamin Knoll is the John Marshall Harlan Associate Professor of Politics at Center College in Danville, Kentucky. He earned his PhD in political science from the University of Iowa. Professor Knoll specializes in public opinion and voting behavior, in particular, race and politics, religion and politics, and political psychology. And his research has been published in several academic journals, including the Journal of Politics, Political Behavior, Social Science Research, and many others. Kami Jo Bolin is a doctoral student in political science at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Her research interests include gender and politics, representation, and religion and politics. My guests have written a new book, She Preached the Word, about women clergy in the U.S. and the effects they have on their congregations. They recently joined me to talk more about their book and about their extensive research. Now, here is the interview with Benjamin Knoll and Cami Jo Bolin. Thank you, Ben and Cami Jo, for joining me here on Pot Store Podcast. Sure, no problem. Thank yeah. you for having us. Both of you are political science researchers at different stages of your careers. What I find fascinating, and I'm sure many of my listeners will too, is that academics often arrive at their research specialties due to their own intellectual or personal curiosities and experiences. Ben and Cami Jo, could you share in your own words your academic specializations and a little bit about the journey towards deciding on those types of topics? So I have always been interested in politics. I came from a family that always talked about politics around the dinner table. And I started wanting to study women in politics because I've never been represented by a a woman aside from the city council level. So as I was um, going through high school and then especially in college, I had some of Ben's classes. It just got me thinking that, well, why don't we see more women in politics and what factors could help encourage more women to run? And as far as religion and politics, um, I grew up in a conservative congregation, but to a liberal family. So issues such as women clergy or women's leadership in the church were always just a personal interest in me, given my own background. Okay, cool. And uh, what about you, Ben? On my end, um, I earned my PhD in political science with an interest in immigration policy attitudes. Um, I wanted to know why do people feel the way they do about immigration, and that led me into Um, having a specialization in identity politics, specifically in terms of race and ethnicity in politics. So I'd look at questions like, um, how are people's personal characteristics related to how they feel about different kinds of uh, public policy options that affect Latino immigrants and things in in that kind of way? And after a couple of years of doing that, um, the issue of women's ordination came on my radar screen because um, I grew up in the Mormon tradition, and a couple of years ago, a movement called the Ordained Women Organization began advocating for women's ordination within the LDS tradition. And so a lot of my friends and family members were talking about it, and a lot of arguments were put forth that sounded very similar to how I had learned about 
race and ethnicity in politics in terms of representation. Like, does it matter if the person who is representing you, whether it be in a political environment, I started to see like, are there parallels that could also apply, say, in a religious setting, like a congregation is the person who's leading the congregation, similar to say, leading in a political context, does that have the same kind of effects on people's attitudes and behaviors as we see in the political sphere? And so I thought, okay, well, there's a lot of people talking about this topic, but we can move this over and apply some of the lessons from political science to try to answer similar kinds of questions, but in a religious context. So that's how I got interested in this topic here. All right, cool. That's really neat. So speaking of that, uh, you both recently published your research on women clergy in the book, She Preached the Word. Tell us a bit about what led you to research the topic of women clergy in particular. I know you mentioned a little bit about that, Ben. Uh, What about you, Cami Jo? Yes. So I was able to begin on this project when I was in my undergraduate career at Center College, where Ben's a professor. So for one of my early, maybe my sophomore year research papers, I wrote on a similar topic about um, the connection between religious denomination and views on women in politics. So from that, Ben, or Dr. Noldemy at the time, he knew I was interested in topics of gender and politics and female clergy. And then I had the opportunity one summer to work with Ben and another student as um, student researchers. So from that and from using some survey data that Ben had collected with some of his other students, I was able to do a research paper on this topic. And then we got some interesting results and we decided we could try to turn this into a bigger project. And then eventually it became the book. Awesome. Ben, did you have anything to add to this? No, that about sums it up. That's how we got interested in the topic. And that's what we were able to do. This was very much a a student-centered kind of a project at Center College. From the data collection, whether it be through the public opinion surveys that we use or the face-to-face interviews, these were all conducted by students as part of undergraduate research modules in their courses. Um, We had a number of upper-level senior students who participated in a research seminar where we hashed out some of these ideas even more and did the interviews for this. And then Cammie Jo's been a a co-author all along the way. So that's been great. Um, they always say it like, you know, takes a village to write a book, but it's really true in our case. That's awesome. And it sounds really great that you were able to engage students in this whole endeavor. Um, speaking of the data, so I know that in the social sciences, it can sometimes be a challenge to obtain data that can truly get at what you're trying to observe and measure. Now, my understanding is that the data that you collected for the book was data that you guys collected yourselves. Yes, that's correct. Okay. And so the data that was analyzed included the gender and religious representation survey, which was, it was conducted in 2015, as well as the fall of 2016, as well as dozens of face-to-face interviews with clergy and congregants that were conducted in 2015. Now, Honestly, like I'm a huge fan of researching a given topic or phenomenon using both quantitative and qualitative methods. The quantitative piece, or in other words, the use of empirical data, what can be measured or quantified, what can be used for statistical tests and modeling, it often gives us some insight into patterns of belief, belonging, and behavior that can be generalizable to the populations that are studied. And then also the quantitative piece is really neat because it gives us some human insight, color, and context to the numbers. How did you decide on the methodology? Like, Did you guys kind of have a plan going in? What drove your approach? Well, like all research endeavors, it was one idea at first that kind of morphed into another idea. And it, you know, it was dynamic and changed as it went along before we kind of decided. Um, It started because back in 2014, when this was going on, I had students just doing public opinion surveys as part of um, as part of a research component of our classes, asking questions about politics and elections and all that kind of stuff. But in the news at the time, there were a couple of things just of personal interest to me in terms of things that were going on in the Catholic Church and in the Mormon Church and in Protestant um, environment and such like that. So I put a couple of questions in there 
related to those kinds of things going on just to see if it turned up anything interesting on there. And when we got the results, I was taking a look at them and thought, well, it's something this could become something interesting here. And so as Cami Joe was saying, that was one of the projects that we worked on that summer was just exploring that data more and seeing what was there. And it turned out that there was something substantive there. So we thought, okay, well, we can take this even further then. So the next couple of semesters, when the students did those same projects, we put those same questions on surveys and gathered over a thousand different survey respondents on those particular questions so that we could get as good of representative a sample as possible of the U.S. population on this. Yeah, I, I noticed that it was, especially for what you guys were studying, it's a pretty good sample size. So I thought that that was really neat, especially with it being original research. Oh, that, that was great. We Again, you know, I owe it to, to our hundreds of students who did 12 hours a semester for calling and getting hung up on over and over again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I used to do research surveys when I was in grad school and... Yeah, I know those feelings. <laughs> <laughs> we all go through it, indeed. Right. Uh, so I noticed while reading the book that there seemed to maybe be a disconnect between, say, denominations allowing women to be clergy and women actually taking on this role in congregations that were part of religious traditions that allow women clergy. Even in denominations and religious traditions that allow the ordination of women, it seems like a small percentage of women, even in those denominations, head them up as leaders. I guess considering that women are just over half the U.S. population and constitute over half the congregants in many houses of worship, it's strange that so few are in leadership, even in denominations that allow it. What do you think are some key roadblocks to women becoming clergy? One thing that we kind of noticed throughout this project is that we kept seeing all of these parallels between the religious sphere as far as the low percentages of women in these leadership positions, but then also there are similarly low numbers of women in Congress or as CEOs. So this wasn't the core of our book, but it was interesting to see the ways in which these various arenas were connected. And one thing that we found through our qualitative interviews is that a lot of people discussed their experiences with female clergy as leading to their support. So even in congregations that allow women to lead, people who haven't personally had a woman as their pastor before, there's some initial hesitancy there. So even if they support it in theory, before they actually experience having a woman lead their congregation, they, they don't know quite what to think about it. So I guess that's one roadblock to overcome is if your congregation has never had a woman, even if it's allowed, it's hard to get the first woman to lead. Mm -hmm. And then once that first woman is, is there, it creates patterns of female leadership. Right. That was one of the interesting findings from our whole thing. As you, as you alluded to there, we specifically were looking at the congregational level and just asking people on our surveys in the congregation that you attend most often is the principal religious leader, male or female, and would you support women being allowed to serve as the principal religious leader in your congregation? And just when we're looking at those who say that they attend church at least occasionally in the United States, only about one in 10 people said that they attend congregations where women are currently serving, and only a little over half said that they're in a congregation where women, in principle, are invited to, to be a pastor or a priest. But even amongst those, for the half of the population, who the church-going population who attends a congregation with a more inclusive gender policy with leadership, we found that only about 17% of those had a woman serving as the principal congregational leader. So one of our key takeaways from this is it's more common in principle than in practice in the United States right now. That makes sense. Um, so I was kind of looking into this a little bit before we got together and had this conversation. And I had stumbled across an article that was written, I want to say maybe a couple of years ago. And it was about Black Baptists who were, they were part of 
independent Baptist churches, as well as maybe larger Baptist denominations. But there's a lot of decisions within a lot of these Baptist churches that are made at congregational level. And it was interesting because even though on the denominational level and in principle, women were allowed to serve, there were still roadblocks for them serving as far as mentorship, as far as pastors not wanting to mentor women that wanted to be pastors. So there were a lot of obstacles, even though in theory, women would be allowed to serve. Mm -hmm. We found some additional on that, just asking people, like regardless of whatever the um, policy of your current congregation is, just would you prefer that your personal clergy person is a man or a woman? And amongst them, Roughly half of the people said, oh, it doesn't matter, you know, either one. But only 9% of everyone we talked to said, I would prefer a woman serve as my principal religious leader. And when you look at it just amongst women, that goes up only to about 11%. It's not that much higher, even just amongst women. They're a little bit more likely to say it doesn't matter. Um, but even then, that's so that's something that could also lead into this here in terms of like on the demand side. Cammy Joe talked a little bit about the supply side, but this is all very, very interesting to us here. People usually are willing to say it doesn't matter or they prefer a man, but really only about one in 10 Americans, you know, regardless of whatever uh, church or religious uh, congregation they happen to go to indicates a clear preference for a woman mm-hmm. in that capacity. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I kind of also want to maybe hone in a little bit on, I think, something that was mentioned earlier about the idea that the gender gap in the religious sphere, there's some mirroring between that and the gender gap in other areas of public life. So I kind of wanted to have you guys talk a little bit more about what you found in terms of how those are related. Yeah, so I can start and then I'll let Ben add some details. But one of our chapters that I found the most interesting to me personally is about the role model effect of female clergy. So in that chapter, given some of the statistical data and the surveys, we were able to ask women if whether or not the most influential spiritual leader in their youth was a man or a woman. And from that, we then asked the respondents just about their levels of self-esteem. And we found that there, there was a strong correlation between a woman having a strong female leader in their youth and then higher self-esteem as an adult. So just thinking about that, there's a connection that can be made between women having these role models when they were young and then being self-confident adults and maybe adults who would see themselves as running for office one day. Mm -hmm. And Ben, would you like to add to that? Yeah, and that's right in line with other research just on role models more generally. Um, Part of the research that we did for this book, I mean, it's you know, a self-evident thing that role models matter, right? Like there's all kinds of research showing that children and young adults who have positive role models in their life, um, that leads to all kinds of positive outcomes in terms of well-being and education, health, um, self-esteem, you know, all that kind of stuff. But amongst that, it's like, what kind of role model is it? And there's more research that's shown that gender roles are an especially important type of role model for children and young adults that children are especially sensitive to the kinds of things that they see the men or the women doing in their in their lives when they're young. And when they see a role or a job being done exclusively by a man or a woman, they're very likely to internalize that subconsciously as well as consciously that that's a specifically a feminine or a masculine type role. And then depending on if they themselves consider themselves, you know, masculine or feminine, then they implicitly internalize, oh, that's something that I can do, or, oh, that's something that I don't do. That's not for me. So I need to do something else um, in my life. And that starts even just at a very, very early age. So that could also help contribute to this, both in religious congregations, but just in society and politics more broadly. So as far as the gender gap and role modeling and some of that kind of stuff, did you guys find anything that might be, say, unique to religion or unique to certain like traditions that may also account for the gap? Well, going back to the interviews, one related finding that 
a few different women told us in the interviews was that they began to question the role of women in the church once they saw women become doctors or women lead businesses in their hometown. So once they saw women leading in other capacities in their communities, they began to question, well, why can't women lead in my church? So I think that could also work in the reverse. If a girl grows up in a congregation where a woman is the head pastor or priest, she could also transfer that confidence or that role model into whatever career that she chooses to pursue. We also found some evidence in our in our survey analysis that this religious representation can also bleed over into other aspects. So for example, Cami Jo talked about the the self-esteem thing, but it's important because that self-esteem is linked to all kinds of other types of outcome like life success, general happiness, job satisfaction, all that kind of stuff. We also found that for women, if they had a female religious leader in their youth, even at least some of the time that had positive effects, it didn't it wasn't a huge effect, but it did move the needle somewhat in terms of their eventual levels of education, eventual levels of full time employment. And you're asking things that are unique about a religious context. Uh, we found that it also had a, a bigger effect in terms of a person's view of the nature of God. And this is this is important. Um, there's all kinds of sociologists of religion who have talked about like different ways we can categorize like how people think about uh, who God is. Is God more authoritative, more critical, more benevolent, more distant, et cetera, et cetera. And one way that we cut into it is by using some previous research that puts people's views of God on a scale from, say, more gracious to more authoritative, whether people consider God to be, say, more of a friend or more of a king or more of a lover, more of a judge, more of a spouse, master, you know, that kind of thing. And we found that that is that does make a, a big difference when people had, as their most influential youth leader, a woman instead of a man, they tended to have, especially for females, a more gracious view of God. They tended to think of God more as a friend, lover, spouse, as opposed to a king, judge, and a master. And so that has important, of course, theological implications, but there's other kinds of research that shows that when a person thinks of God more in those gracious as opposed to authoritative terms, that that also affects things like their levels of self-worth, general life happiness, volunteer motivation to do things, lower levels of anxiety and obsession, paranoia, like all these kinds of things are linked to that, which then we take one step further and show that at least partially those are attributable to the gender makeup of the religious leaders in these young person's lives at earlier points in their life. Wow, that sounds very far reaching. It seems like there are some major effects there. In our book, we, we don't have direct, direct evidence of it, but what we show is all of the previous research shows that people who have those views of God or those outcomes tend to also have those same like levels of health and psychology and employment and all those kinds of stuff. And we're taking it and we're making a, a link to point A on that, saying, well, where do those attitudes come from to begin with? Where are they having those kinds of experiences as a youth, which lead to those things which are then associated? So we say in the book that this is an indirect connection, mm -hmm. but nonetheless, the evidence is there that, you know, these things matter. They're, they're a point in a series of things that lead to these particular life outcomes for people. And so that's one of the reasons that we argue that this is one of the things that we find. This is, um, while not taking a specific position in our book, like theologically speaking, we do take a position that these are things that churches and religious communities ought to be thinking about as they have these theological discussions and have they have these conversations that this might be something to take into consideration. Okay. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. So shifting gears a little bit, do you believe that in the future, women may be allowed to take on roles as clergy in religious traditions and denominations that don't currently allow it? And if so, what do you think it would take for that change to occur? So one of the findings from previous research by Mark Chaves is that there's a great deal of what he calls decoupling between women's leadership in practice and women's leadership in policy. So what he means by that is that even in the Catholic tradition, 
there in some maybe more rural congregation, there are women functionally serving as priest, even though they don't technically have that title. So I think as far as that sort of leadership, that's happening now, even in congregations where it's not technically allowed. And I see that to continue to occur in the future. My perspective on this is oftentimes we have this perception that religious communities and religious theology is a static thing that never changes. And all anyone's got to do is go back five to ten years to see how you know religious communities and ideas and conversations are constantly in flux. They're, they're always being debated and discussed and and religious institutions that are successful are those that have shown over the decades, centuries, and millennia that they're able to maintain their distinctiveness, but also able to adapt as the culture and the society adapts. They can't just be like mainstream culture or else there's no reason to be a part of it because then there's no difference from the culture. So they have to be different, but they can't be too different because then they'll be too too fringy and they'll lose their market share essentially that's what sociologists have shown so some institutions for example the the tradition that i come from the mormon tradition there's good sociological research on that showing that one of the reasons that it's survived from say the restorationist movement and the second great awakening in the early american republic is because it's been really good at doing that thing at striking that balance between maintaining a distance but not too much of a distance from from the wider society. So asking about predictions for the future, our book specifically doesn't get into that because we're looking more at just people's attitudes and how it affects their behaviors and such. But just based on what we know from other things, I think there's good reasons to think that sooner or later, and the later maybe centuries later, (laughs) but (laughs) if we're just looking at general trends, West, you know, the society is moving toward a more gender egalitarian mind frame for decades, if not centuries now. If that continues, and it's again, assuming that tradition and assuming that that pattern holds, it will be increasingly difficult for religious traditions to appeal to any kind of meaningful audience if they're not at least somewhat following that trajectory. So that's my prediction on that. Assuming the trends hold. I would assume any successful church will eventually have to find some sort of gender egalitarianism in its leadership in order to survive in the long run. But again, you know, mm-hmm. all things all things being equal. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Like kind of wrapping up a little bit. Do you think that religion in general has the same power in American society as it did say 30 or 40 years ago? And kind of going along with that, Do you think that there may come a time when the religious gender gap will no longer have the same influence on the role of gender in other areas of public life? That's a really good question. Um, Our survey was, so our research is based on adults that are living in the United States right now who were, so, so one of the questions we asked, you know, was the gender makeup of religious leaders when they were young. And other surveys, like the General Social Survey, was asking adults, like people over the age of 18 right now, if they attended church services when they were young. And right now, just about 95% of the American public said, yeah, when I was a kid, we went to religious services at least once in a while. But those who are growing up and are kids right now that's no longer the case. So perhaps people in 20, 30 years, when they look back at their childhood, there's probably going to be less than 95% who say, yeah, these religious institutions were less a part of my life growing up. Um, so to answer your question on that, I think it's it's hard to argue that religious institutions are more influential just in general American culture than they were, say, in the 1950s and then 1960s. But at the same time, The United States is a huge outlier in the world community in terms of its level of religiosity. Among all our peer nations, right, who are at the same level of industrialized development and education and stuff, they're much, much, much more secular. The United States is an outlier in terms of being industrially developed, but at the same time, very religious. So it may be a long time before religion loses its its influence in the mainstream of American culture and society, if at all. (laughs) 
I was just thinking that it would be interesting to hold a similar study to this in 30 or so years to see if there is smaller percentages of people attending congregations in their youth for those that did attend what effect did, did the clergy gender have but that was just thinking future research i don't think i have anything i think Finn did a good job of of covering okay <laughs> all right cool um so your book she preached the word is currently out on amazon i'll link to it in the show notes it is definitely a great read and it has so many insights that we can possibly cover it all here. So listeners definitely check that out. So for the both of you, what is next? I'll start with Cami Jo. Yes. So right now I'm trying to come up with a dissertation topic or at least within the next year or so. So I think I will do Something similar. I'm especially interested, like I mentioned earlier, in the effects of women in as role models. I think I'll continue to want to study the various parallels between women's leadership in religious spheres and political spheres. But I'm still trying to work out the details to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know those feelings. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> so, but yeah, that. But I mean, it looks like you have a great start. So, so that's so that's you. good. And and for you, Ben? Um, so I'm continuing. This is one of my research projects for the last couple of years. Um, I'm starting with some new projects now that are just kind of at their early stages, and we'll see we'll see how they go. I'm still interested in the intersection of religion and politics in America. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to see what trajectories that takes. Awesome. So are you guys on social media at all? Like if listeners want to reach out to you, what would be the best way to do so? I am available on Twitter at Benjamin Knoll 28, all one word, lowercase. Um, or if you go to my website, uh, www.informationknoll.com, then my contact information is there. And I am also on Twitter. It's at C Joe Bolin. That's C-J-O-B-O-L-I-N. And I do not have a website yet. So Twitter is the best. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, Ben and Cami Jo, it's been an honor to have you both on Pot Stir Podcast. Your book was very well written and very informative. And your research interests are definitely right up my alley. So I look forward to seeing more great research from you both in the future. Thank you so much for joining me. And thank you for having us. Yes, we appreciate it very, very much. If you would like to check out the book, She Preached the Word, it's available on Amazon. I'll have a link to it in the show notes, as well as some other great resources provided by Ben and Cami Jo if you'd like to learn more about women clergy. If you would like to learn more about a variety of fascinating topics, check out Stranger Still, another awesome show on the Flying Machine Network. Each week, Nick and John pick a topic from the worlds of science and technology, research it, and talk about it on their show. Their most recent episode is about the herb Kratom, which can be used as a recreational drug. The DEA wants to ban it. Is Kratom harmless or not? Definitely check out Stranger Still. They are on iTunes, Stitcher, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. I highly recommend you listen and subscribe. Also, check out their website on StrangerStillShow.com. And you can check out Stranger Still and all the other great shows of the Flying Machine Network on FlyingMachine.network slash shows. Thanks so much for listening to Pot Stirrer Podcast. If you enjoyed the podcast, subscribe on iTunes or on Android. Go to PotStirrerPodcast.com slash download. And links are right there. If you subscribe, you can get the most recent episodes once they're released, so you don't have to wait even for a second. I want to hear from you. If you enjoyed the podcast, please give us five stars and leave a review. And you can find me on Twitter at PotStirCast, where I'm quite active. I'm Jay Poole. Let's fight for America's future, because freedom is not free. I give you the incredible
flying machine! <laughs>